Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charlene Edwards. I am the Director of Programs and Events with Project Unity, and I want to welcome you all to uh, Project Unity's Summer Listen and Learn Speaker Series. Uh, we are so honored this evening um, to have um, civil rights activist Reverend Peter Johnson um, join us um, to share his story and allow us to walk in his shoes. Um, so I believe we're all in for um, a great um, uh, evening tonight. Joining uh, Reverend Johnson is Andy Stoker, uh, the Chief Engagement Officer um, with Thanksgiving Foundation. Um, they are located tonight at the Hall of Thanksgiving um, at Thanksgiving Square here in Dallas. Um, so before I turn it over to them, I do want to let you all know um, that we will have Q&A um, at the end of our Listen and Learn tonight, um, like the last 15 or so minutes. So if you have a question at any time, please feel free to post it in the chat. Um, it will come to me and hopefully I'll have an opportunity to um, get through as many of those questions as possible. Uh, in the meantime, we do want to go ahead and get started uh, for the sake of time. So this time, Reverend Johnson, Andy Stoker, thank you both again for joining us tonight. And I'll turn it over to you both. Charlene, thank you so much. It is a gift to be here with you uh, tonight, all of you, and also most especially uh, with the Reverend Peter Johnson. Uh, Reverend Johnson, what a joy it is. We find ourselves in this situation again, uh, remembering and giving thanks for your good work. So tonight, what we're going to do is have a conversation uh, and maybe uh, an arc is past, present, and future. And so tell us a little bit about your growing up in Louisiana. Tell us a little bit about what got you engaged, involved, inspired uh, in the civil rights movement as a young man. Well, first, thank you, Sir Charlene. And good to see you, Andy. And uh, wonderful to be here with Kyle at Thanksgiving Foundation. And uh, Kyle knows how special and important this place is to me. On a stormy, rainy day, I picked up a lady at the airport named Rosa Parks, and I brought her to this building. And we took pictures with Miss Parks in this building. That would be Rosa Parks' last trip to Dallas. And that would be the last time I would see her alive on this earth. Mm -hmm. So this building has deep, deep, special, special, special meaning to me. Um, and that rainy day that we brought Rosa Parks here. I'm honored to be here with you, Andy. Thank you. Um, and to be able to spend some time talking about yesterday and yesterday's unique relationship to today and how we're going to plan for tomorrow based on what we learned today and yesterday. And hopefully we won't make the same damn mistakes we made yesterday <laughs> that we will learn from them. A part of what I want to do and is to talk about, obviously, uh, the challenges that this part of the country face, but the challenges that our nation face regarding the ongoing problem of bloodshed and guns in the American society. And um, it, it is a difficult, difficult subject because um, America don't exist without gunpowder and guns. That's why America exists. If the Mohegans had gunpowder, America wouldn't be here today. So guns is, it has a unique historical relationship to the reality of America's existence. But as men of God, we must be brutally honest about the bloodshed that the gun industry is causing in my community and throughout America from Los Angeles to New York, that guns being shot at people every day in America. And uh, we must not be solid about this ongoing bloodshed in our society. Uh, I grew up in the civil rights movement. I was the youngest man to work for Martin Luther King and the best looking one. I don't give a damn what Jesse Jackson say. Look at us when we were young men, I was better looking. Uh, I grew up working in the civil rights movement. Um, all my life, from the time I was 13 years old, 
uh, I went to the March on Washington, August 28, 63, when Martin King told the world about his dream. I was under the steps that day. So historically, I've been involved in the civil rights movement since 1959. My father was president of the NAACP. He was friends with Roy Wilkins and Thurgood Marshall. My youngest brother, Calvin, is a retired judge in New Orleans. He teaches law school at Loyola. Calvin is a judge because of my father and Thurgood Marshall and Roy Wilkins. So my history in the civil rights movement, from the time I knew who I was, I knew that I was involved in the civil rights movement. My father was the head of the Black Masons. I grew up in a civil rights church. The church I grew up in in South Louisiana was the Plymouth Rock Baptist Church. It became known in the civil rights movement as the Freedom Rock Church. My church was tear gas bombed four times in 1963. It is where most demonstrations came out of that church than any other church in the South. Uh, that family, the pastor of that church, and Dr. King's family, Daddy King, these were families very uniquely tied together in the Black religious South. So I literally grew up around these people. Ralph Abernathy married me and my wife almost 50 years ago. Dr. Abernathy was like a daddy to me. I traveled literally all over the world with him. Um, I was sent to Dallas, Texas in 1969. I got here, I was sent here in 1967. Martin King was assassinated in 68. And because of our commitment to continue, Dr. King's commitment to do something about the poor people in America and poverty, I didn't get to Dallas until 1969. I came in 1969 we were in the process of trying to deal with the realities that Martin King died without no money and without no life insurance. With those little children, they were little bitty children, I could hold them in my arms. So the idea was, how can we help Mrs. King raise Martin's babies so she don't have to bathe? Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier came to Atlanta, we met at Pascal's Motel. Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, and a Jewish producer out of Hollywood named Samuel Livingston, Samuel Boy. They came to us and presented a concept. And the idea was, this is Sidney Poitier and Belafonte and Samuel Boy, Samuel Livingston. They came and said, listen, we can take Martin King's life and make a full-length movie and it can premiere all over the world and we can raise the money and put it in some kind of slick money investment, but she gonna get money every month from this money. I, I never understood, but they knew uh, uh, this Jewish man that was our friend, Sammy, that they could, they could raise enough money with the movie, they could sit Mrs. King up for the rest of her life and her children. So we agreed to work with Hollywood and uh, our friend Harry Belafonte in Sydney. And uh, once the movie was completed, the movie was going to premiere in 800 cities around the world. Listen, 800 cities around the world. So when we met again in Atlanta, all of us nationally, with Andy Young officiating, but Rob Abernathy, breaking the world up into sections where they were going to send staff to organize this movie. So as soon as they said that, I put my hand up. I want to go to how the Virgin Islands. That seems like a good place to send me. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So the response from Ralph Abernathy and Daddy King, Peter, put your hand down. You're going to Dallas. That's how I got here. The reason Dallas had Love Field, didn't have anything to do with the city. Love Field was the best airport to get around the Southwest. My responsibility for the premiere showing of Martin King's movie was going to be the southwestern states, five states, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. Those were my five states. The movie was going to premiere, God, I, maybe in November 1969. I got here in August, I think, if I remember correctly, September 1969. 
when I got here, I arrived at Love Field. I was met at the airport by a group of African-American citizens from Dallas, Texas. Don't know how they knew I was coming, how they knew what flight I was going to be on. When I got off that plane at Love Field, I met a man named Albert Lipton, a woman named Elsa Faye Higgins, a man named J.B. Jackson, and a black preacher that I knew who's not here anymore, who had pastored a church in Atlanta. And they told me that they needed help that the city of Dallas was taking their houses, their homes in South Dallas, their park. And I explained to them, I work for Andrew Young. If I help you, all ain't going to fire me. I have an assignment that I must do. I'm sorry I can't help you. Checked in a hotel in downtown Dallas. Late that night, Albert Liston, Mr. J.B. Jackson, and three or four other people from South Dallas knocked on my hotel door with a man named Gideon Johnson. Mr. Gideon Johnson was almost 80 years old. He was 79 years old at the time. And he, he was crying, begging that I helped him. And Mr. Gideon Johnson shook his finger in my face and he said that Dr. King was alive, he had helped us. Mm. And that made me cry. Because mm. Dr. King stopped our work the old people to help garbage workers. And, and you know, when we told Dr. King, the garbage workers, no, Dr. King stopped what he was doing to go help garbage workers. So I knew that this was a message God was sending me, you know, that I need to listen to these people and help them. So I agreed to come to South Dallas, met at Mark Herbner's old church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mark Herbner was a white Lutheran pastor, but he was pastor in a church in South Dallas, and he was probably the most militant preacher in Dallas, <laughs> this white Lutheran from Germany. All right, so we, I met two or three days later with these people, but I had to organize this premiere showing of this movie because the idea was to use this opportunity to raise money for Coretta and Dr. King's babies. But I promised the Fair Park homeowners once this is over, I'll do what I can to help you all. And we've got a bunch of lawyers. I'll see whether or not we can get our lawyers involved in this. Um, the movie became a big success here in spite of the city fighting against the movie being shown. But the movie became a big success here. And then the rest, in fact, all over the world, we raised the money to take care of Coretta and Dr. King's babies. I was supposed to go back to Atlanta our national headquarters after the movie was shown. But one of the things that I would do to my boss at that time, who was Andy Young, I just wouldn't respond. Yeah. Wasn't no cell phones or texts, all of the stuff that, so he would have to call me on a, you know, a phone. And my idea was, and, and, and where I would go, somebody would tell me, Ambassador Andrew Young is trying to find you. Andy Young said, call him. I just wouldn't call Andy. <laughs> So I would have, that was a Negro radio station. I was listening to the radio station one night and a news bulletin came on. We interrupted this program for a news bulletin. This is on the Negro radio station. Reverend Andrew Young has fried Reverend Peter Johnson. I found out on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it wasn't a new experience. I got fired two or three times a year. That was, <laughs> and it was fine. Me all in all, I would do, I'd go to Coretta, cry. She'd call in and make him hire me back, and they would make excuses for me because of my youth. Because when they would say, Man, you know, Peter's young and in mature. You know, you all took him out of college too early. So she would just be on my side. Yeah. And Annie would just cuss and say, Well, yeah, I'm gonna hire him back. So um, I ended up staying here. Uh, first, they have to file for our homeowners and, uh, and to bring national lawyers here, understanding that eminent domain is absolute. You're not gonna win that fight. But for the city, the reason I convinced our national lawyers and our national leaders to take a look at South Dallas and Fowl Park, there were white families in Highland Park that owned rent houses in South Dallas. All of the houses was owned, a lot that was 50 feet wide, 100 feet deep. All of the houses was three bedrooms, one bathroom, wood frame houses built during after the war. So now a white family owned in a house, see this house is a 1424 
East Street. It's owned by a white family. The city's offering this family 2,050 cents a square foot for their property. Next though, these people is black. The city's offering them 50 cents a square foot. Same lot, same house, nothing different other than pigmentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought that Reverend Abernathy in Atlanta, if I would write him and tell him, hey man, we need to help these people, that he would give me permission to do it. So instead of me arguing and wrestling with Andy, I said I wrote a long letter to Reverend Abernathy, who was the head of SCLC at the time, and said, you know, this is something we ought to help these people. And uh, I want to stay and help them. Um, Ralph never responded. So I stayed anyway. And Andy fired me. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I'm a crack credit made him hire me back. But in staying here, we realized that in the South, Texas had been ignored. That the rest of the South, where we had made tremendous changes, it had not happened in Texas. Mm -hmm. In fact, this city still had a system called Ad Lodge, which was really in conflict with the Voting Rights Act, in conflict with the lessons of John Lewis, in terms of one man, one vote. Mm -hmm. The, the, the whole concept was uh, really denying black and brown people the ability to represent them, their communities. Uh, and I thought that this was something that we can get our teeth in and this is something that we could win. Now, the biggest thing I've done in 1969 was um, every year in Dallas at that time, they had something called the Cotton Bowl football game. It was a national deal. And like the Rose Bowl, they would have a Cotton Bowl National Parade on national television. So I had a meeting New Year's Eve in Mark Rubner's old church and invited all of the Fair Park homeowners. But that week, there was something that, that we called mailograms. Instead of telegrams, it was very cheap. I could send this thing called milligrams all over America to my partners and ask them to come to Dallas and go to jail with me. So I sent out my milligrams to my friends all over America, mostly hippies, white kids from anti-war movement who had become friends with us in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And we had developed a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful working relationship uh, during those years. They pulled into Dallas with their long hair and they... <laughs> <laughs> they backpacked. I mean, it came all the way from as far as way from San Francisco, yeah. from New York, from North and South Carolina. They put it into Dallas. So my deal was we're going to let the man know unless he meets with the Power Park homeowners, we're going to block the Cotton Bowl Parade on national television. And my gamble was you can't cancel New Year's. It's coming and tomorrow it's going to be here. And uh, you got to change, meet with these people at a black church. I'm a, and I got my soldiers here to do it. Well, we met in at Mark Herbner's church that night at about 11.30. Mayor Eric Johnson shows up in his limousine with Frank Dyson, who was the new chief of police, and um, came and said that they wanted to meet with me. Well, I told him, I don't have no house that somebody had taken from me. You need to respect and talk to people whose homes you're taking. And no, I'm not going to meet with you. And no need for me to talk to you. And you have to respect people's houses that you're taking. So about an hour later, we got a call, and the chief of police comes and says, the mayor, this is New Year's Eve, is in his office in downtown Dallas. He's willing to meet with anybody to keep you from doing what you say you're going to do. Right. So we headed down. That, that was a black cab company here. And we knew, I knew the man that owned the cab company. He, he provided cabs. So we went down to the mayor's office, which is at that time Republic Bank building. Mm -hmm. And uh, I prayed with the Falcon homeowners and held our hands and told them that 
I wasn't going to go to meet with the man. Y'all need to look him in his eyes. Don't look at your shoes. Don't laugh. Don't smile. Look him in his eyes and tell him about your homes. Some of these men were GIs from World War II, mm. and they were buying that house with the GI Bill. Yeah. Uh, and my, my challenge to them was, you don't need somebody to speak for you. Speak for yourself. Look him in. So when we got there, and the man invited me in, I told him I wasn't coming in tonight. I don't own no property in Texas. That you got to talk to these people whose houses you be on the And I wouldn't go in to meet. Um, I just stayed outside and prayed. And uh, when they came out, they were all in tears. And Mrs. Higgins, as a face, she said, "Well, Peter, you can't believe this. He agreed to everything." I say, yeah, because he can't cancel a gun bull parade. <laughs> it's it's going to be tomorrow. Um, so when I got back to, we went, went back to Mark Criminal's old church, and it's one o'clock in the morning now. I called Dr. Alvin out there at his house and called Andy and wake them up and tell them that we've managed to have a major, major, major victory here. The mayor met with the homeowners and have agreed uh, to allow experts to determine the value of that property. And the young and rubbing out the government out said, Peter, let me tell you something. When you hang this phone up, no, get the hell out of Texas. Don't want you to wake up in Texas. <laughs> and, and Ralph said, no, you, you, <laughs> Peter, you know you're hard headed and you're stubborn. I want you out of, I want you. He said, now we, the, the black cab company Gave me a free cab and a cab drive. We, we call him Popeye's name with A.J. Hoffman. He's dead now. So Dr. Alvin had to say, go to the Holiday Inn in Shreveport. <laughs> call your cab and tell him come take you. And I want you to wake up in Shreveport, not in Dallas. So Popeye drove me all the way to Shreveport, to the Holiday Inn, where I went to bed. I got to the Holiday Inn probably 4 o'clock in the morning. I went to bed. When I woke up that morning and got back up, turned on the television, Sam Donaldson was talking about the Cotton Bowl Parade and, and coming down the street. And then Sam said, and I have no idea who that Negro man is sitting next to the mayor in the mayor's car. It was Mr. Jackson from him. Because uh, one of the things I told the mayor is that if there ain't no Negroes in the Cotton Bowl Parade, don't stay a block. Yeah. So you must have some black people in it. Segregated parades. That's going to be in the past. Yeah. So Mr. Jackson was one of the foul pockets. He was oh, a tall, yeah. gray-headed, yes. uh, Mohouse graduate, you yeah. know, just a dignified man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. Uh, and that was my first major, major victory here. And what that said to black leaders is that it is possible to non-violence, mm -hmm. to make progress. We didn't throw no rocks, no bombs. We didn't shoot nobody. Uh, but we stood our ground. Uh, and it was the first episode and experience that people like Albert Lipscomb had with nonviolence. So it gave them an idea that through nonviolent protests, you can change this part of the country. Mm -hmm. And um, I did not go back to Atlanta. I stayed here because there were things I thought we could do here that we owed this part of the South. And of course, um, like I said, Andy fired me, but Coretta would always, I would get fired two or three times a year. Yeah. That was, it means it came with on my side. Yeah. Reverend Johnson, yeah. can you, uh, when you tell these stories, uh, what, what keeps coming to mind for me is collaboration. You have friends in the Lutheran church. You've got friends that you're calling, et cetera. As we're moving into this, um, maybe our present moment and maybe your current work now uh, from 1969 to today. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about this collaborative work, your your ways of being in the world and how uh, how you network and how you reach out to folks and, well, and activate them? Uh, well, first, uh, I am not down or depressed about what I see, especially this this, this generation of young people. Before Ralph Abernathy died, when he was sick, I went to see him. When he was dying, he would live two or three days later. 
And of course, he looked up at me from my bed. And he, he called me Hall. See, and Dr. King both. Yeah. Hall, how old are you now? And I told him. He said, you're still a baby. <laughs> but he said, listen, if God lets you live, there's a generation of white kids coming. They're not going to see color. They're not going to see none of the stuff that we fought against. He's, Dr. Ralph told me, he said, there's a generation coming. They're here. Mm. What he told them, they're here now. So we have what we have to do now in terms of uh, nationally, the generation of children that's in school in America today, they pass race. Race is not an issue with them. Race is not a subject with them. Uh, uh, discrimination won't be a part of that generation. You know, um, how to survive financially is the biggest challenge that's going to face Black America mm. in the years to come. Mm. It, it, it will not be racism. Um, the, the, the nation will never go backwards. In other words, in spite of Donald Trump, the right to vote is going to be here for my grandchildren and their grandchildren. That's not going to change. So America is not going to back up. But that does not mean that we don't have challenges. We do have challenges because of poverty. Anytime you have, for instance, Dallas is one of the richest cities on this earth. They got people go to bed in Dallas hungry every night. They got people living on the bridge in one of the richest cities in the history of the earth. But uh, that is not because of a lack of resources. That's because of all the difficulties and complications, uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, just a whole lot of uh, that, 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 that makes it very, very challenging to figure out how, what are you going to do about homelessness when you're dealing with addicted people? Yeah. You know, so the, 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 the questions are very complex and complicated, and there, there are no simple solutions to the challenges that, that we face as a society. Um, the uh, problems of yesterday remain yesterday. We, we passed that now. Yeah. And the reason I know we passed it, I got grandsons and granddaughters. <laughs> they got all kinds of partners. See, when I was growing up, all my partners was black. Yeah. They got they all kinds of partners. They, I mean, they, they, because they're into them, they, they, my world has been gone. Mm -hmm. they, they have no understanding of the differences of race at all because uh, when I went to school, everybody was black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think this tonight, as we're as we're we've come together under this banner of Project Unity. For me, Peter, you've been the one to really model that well, model uh, model what the future could be, and bringing people together of diverse backgrounds. Uh, we're sitting in the Hall of Thanksgiving, uh, where for. On uh, almost 60 years, uh, thanks, those who have been ambassadors at Thanksgiving Square have joined together in a multi-faith, interfaith way to lift the challenges and concerns of the city. And, uh, and with your leadership, I think you exemplify not only what Project Unity stands for, but what it truly means to be a collaborative presence in people's lives. So I'm wondering, um, in all of the experiences that you've had, you've mentioned uh, a Jewish uh, Jewish banker who helped you with uh, with uh, Dr. King's movie, uh, uh, a Lutheran pastor who's uh, who opened the doors of the church, etc. In today's in today's uh, time, uh, what are some ways that you're getting encouraged by collaboration or maybe how maybe a better question is how are you agitating more collaboration and tapping on people's shoulders and introducing people uh to one another and and convening and collaborating with those around well you know as i just say one of the things that i'm working on that to me is one of the greatest challenges to our society and america is we have to do something about these damn guns yeah and uh, what i tell people is listen a bullet is an equal opportunity offender. They don't give a damn what color you are, what denomination you are, uh, how much money you've got. Um, so if we can figure out a way how to unite 
as a society, not as black people or white people or Jewish people or Christian people, but as human beings who we all have bodies that's threatened by guns. And uh, to me, we ought to be able to have some kind of a serious, ongoing, rational discussion about what are we going to do about guns. In Black America, because of the history of Black America, um, we have ongoing bloodshed and violence in Black America. Let me give you some historical mm -hmm. reasons why. Mm -hmm. If I kill you, I ain't going to never get out of jail. If I kill a black man, I'll be out in 14 years or less. Mm. If I rape a white woman, I ain't going to never get out of trouble. If I rape a black woman, I may get five years. I may do three. The criminal justice system has perpetuated a concept of discrimination that makes a decision in South Dallas of a black man stabbing and shooting another black man easier because if he's a black man in South Dallas, he know black men who've shot and stabbed other black men that's out there that they're not in jail. Mm -hmm. He don't know nobody that the stabbed the shot a white man that's, that's not in jail. The criminal justice system has perpetuated a kind of upside down bigotry that is that is perpetuated violence in black America against black Americans. Mm -hmm. It is kind of a hidden challenge that, that we face as a society. Um, and there are no simple solutions. Yeah. Um, uh, the word nigger. Um, basically, it is basically saying, you're not a human being, you're a nigger. And you're not a human being, you're a nigger. You're less than a human being. Mm -hmm. So a part of what has taken place in Black America over the last 10, 15 years is the acceptance of this in our society. Um, it, 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 it is frustrating to me, but because I have grandchildren, I am positive about tomorrow. Yes. Real positive about tomorrow. Because I look at my grandchildren and all their partners, and of course, my life ain't got no relationship to them at all. I, I, I ain't got nothing to do with them. It's just so I am positive about tomorrow because of that generation. Um, now I know that 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 people all over America who raise their children and and inject bigotry in them. Black people, white people, uh, everybody. That, mm -hmm. that that's a part of the American reality. But this generation of children. And they don't, they're not caught up in that. Yeah. You know, their world is so far from mom and dad and grandparents that, that I, like for me, I am very positive on this generation of Americans. Uh, that I, I believe this generation will move America to a more decent and peaceful place, you know, um, and maybe I'm naive. No, I, I, I have that same hope. Uh, and my hope is aligned with yours in that uh, I do believe that we have to uh, value black bodies, period. And the devaluation of black bodies historically is our original sin. Ain't no doubt about it. Yeah. And when we can develop a, uh, develop a way, and maybe it is generational, uh, maybe, maybe it is living it out, maybe it is folks like you, Reverend Peter Johnson, that calls us to, uh, to action and value, yes, Black bodies, and also value maybe our own bodies. <laughs> Get out of our heads long enough and into these bodies to connect human to human to connect on this human level. Uh, as you said, a bullet doesn't know if you're, uh, what denomination you are, what color skin you have, uh, what diagnosis you're, you're carrying with you. Um, but if we got connected 
on the human level, is it possible that we could begin to learn from our kids, our grandkids, what it really means to affirm these bodies we live in and affirm, and by affirming our own bodies, we're able to see people in the totality and re-evaluate truly who our neighbor is. Uh, first, I believe that we must, mm -hmm. that, 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 that we must work, those of us who are still on this earth, to move America from its ugly past and uh, do everything we can to bear that past and not leave it for the next generation. Yeah. Um, I, uh, Martin King would challenge us to, his, his philosophy was, you can change people by treating them not the way they treat you. And Dr. King used to say, if you want to really screw that police officer up who, who beating you, pray for him. Get on your knees and pray for him. And shit, you just make him, he don't know what to do about that. I mean, just the, the decency that came out of King's head of uh, that, and the lessons that young people like me learn of being around him and Andy and, and Ralph Abernathy because my friends was Stokely Carmichael, Hubert Brown and I grew up together. You, you all know him as H. Rap Brown. Yeah, yeah. We grew up 15 minutes from each other. You know, yeah. So the people I grew up with was extremely militant and violent and pissed off at white people. But my blessing was I ended up around King and Andy and Dr. Abernathy and these men. You know how they got my gun from me? How so? They had to rouse me down and take it from me. <laughs> and threatened to tell my mama. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was blessed because that God put me in a position where I was extremely angry, angry, angry with the segregation and the colored and white signs and the brutality and the uh, but I was blessed that. I ended up working at Martin King's organization yeah. uh, with an office in the basement where Martin Luther King was upstairs in the executive <laughs> offices. Yeah. You know, I was down in the basement with the rest of the idiots planning stuff we shouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk about let's talk about those plans in in the this last few minutes that we have. Uh, last few minutes that we have together, uh, maybe a vision for the future, a call to action. Uh, you brought up at the in beginning of our conversation about guns, um, uh, about your passion now, about not only becoming aware of our history, but also really discovering what we can do in the here and now so that this can be put to an end. Can you talk about and maybe call me to action, call us to action in this regard? The NRA has money. Show you how much money the gun industry has. If you go downtown to the Pinners or Sears or Walmart and buy a bicycle, and the bicycle has got a defect and you fall and hurt yourself, you can sue the company. If you go buy a gun and pull the trigger and the damn gun blow up, you can't sue the gun industry. Did you know that? Hmm. They protect it. You can't sue them. For, like if you go buy a car and the brakes don't work, you can sue the car deal. Yeah. But you can't sue the gun industry. They, they, they have invested so much money into politicians that you, you can't even hold them for selling you de deficient uh, 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 it, a gun. It, it, it is the probably for me the most American thing that exists in America is guns. Mm. There's no other country on this earth with the kind of love affair that Americans have for guns. There are no other country on this earth that depends so much on guns. Every sad Friday and Saturday night in America, there's unbelievable gunfire in, 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 in America. This is on an ongoing basis. We have a, I call it a gun neurosis in America. Yeah. Uh, and nobody's benefiting from our gun neurosis, but funeral homes, and that can't be good. Yeah. 
God said, I can't be good. That the, the, the people that's profiting from our guns are funeral homes. Peter, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, Peter, thanks. Uh, what a what an incredible uh, life that you have had and a life that you are offering so many. Thank you for your leadership and your constancy of service. And I'm so glad you ended up in Dallas. <laughs> this is great. Well, so, and a young five is for standing here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So, uh, Charlene, if you want to um, come back on, and we'd love to receive some questions from you. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for um, allowing us to walk in your shoes, Reverend Johnson. This has been amazing. Um, and so thank you. I, I do have some questions that are popping up. And the first question reads, our current climate is filled with disinformation and separation. What concerns me most is that the young activists of the Emmett Till time are not collaborating with the young activists of the George Floyd time. So how do we reunite these activists to ensure we have the unity um, necessary to restore or save our democracy? So you ain't got no easy questions. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> How do we um, marry the two, the, the activists of that time and the activists of this time? I think we need to trust the activists in this new generation. And I think we need to do the same thing that the generation done with us. We need to share with them the most important thing I learned from Thurgood Marshall and Roy Wilkins and Martin King and those men was what not to do. Hmm. Not what to do, what not to do to stay alive, to stay out of the penitentiary, to stay out, of, to be respected by the people you're trying to lead. The most important part, the, the things they taught me was what not to do, you know, you know, how to treat people who hate you, how to treat people who could ruin your life, you know. So to, to me, the most important thing that I learned being around, uh, especially Daddy King, Dr. King's father, was that things that you, you respect everybody. If this deputy sheriff calls you a damn nigga, pray for him. And if you do, you're confusing. Absolutely. That King taught us that the most potent entity on earth is love. That you can literally uh, dis disarm people with compassion and with love. Uh, one of the things that I'm wrestling with here, in, not just in Dallas, but nationally, every national police department in America, Dallas is one. They got police associations. There's a black police association. There's a brown police association. There's a women police association. There's a gay police association. Then there's a police association. That's about 94% all white. So my deal is to police departments, y'all need to figure out how to get along and have an association that's a union, that's all it is, that can protect peace officers, their income, and et cetera, et cetera, and not be segregated. The message that the Dallas Police Department, I'm talking about the ranking five, is sending to the city is that we don't get along with each other. In Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, all of them. So one of the things that I want to do nationally is begin to argue with police departments and with police associations or unions that if you had a police association in Dallas that's one police association, first, it gives you much more influence and power over the politicians than to have four separate ones. Now, you could have an, a, an association and have caucuses, like a black caucus, or African-American caucus, a brown caucus, inside your association. But you have one association to negotiate and fight for what peace officers need in this city. Uh, for instance, my deal is uh, every peace officer on the street ought to have on a vest. You know how much them damn things cost? <laughs> Almost three grand. Mm -hmm. So if you're a ranking fire police officer, you can't afford to buy that thing. So my deal is that maybe the church community could say, we're going to buy vests for all the police officers on the street mm -hmm. because 
the city don't pay them enough, and they, that mean uh, the other that that things that I think the city council can do, for instance, there ought to not be gun shows on city property. Mm. Yeah. You ought to not be able to go to the Walmart or to the, the hardware store and buy armor piercing bullets. Mm. Yeah. That's outlawed by the Geneva Conference on Warfare, but you can go out and go downtown Dallas and buy it. Mm. So these are things that politicians can work on, these things that the churches can do, but they, there's no reason to sell armor piercing bullets in no way. Right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Here's another question. Um, what are your thoughts on the prison justice system on incarceration and besides gun controls, how to prevent it and how to prevent or mitigate? Um, looks like it's rectivism. You, you just insist on hard questions. <laughs> we have a lot of people out there tonight that has a lot, they have a lot of hard questions. <laughs> Let's talk about the, the, the prison system. Well, the prison system, it, it, it has a history of racism and bigotry that's directly tied to segregation and to slavery in the Texas prison system or in the American prison system. Um, the criminal justice system uh, makes decisions based on punishment based on the color of the victim and the color of the victimizer. Mm -hmm. These are things that we must force society to come to grips with. These are issues that politicians are gonna deal with. You have to make them deal with these kind of issues. These are, if you wanna be a successful elected politician, these are the kind of things, you can't talk about this kind of stuff, you know? So, People who call themselves leaders that stand in pulpits must be challenged to call them like they see them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so here's another question. Um, I have observed your service in Dallas on behalf of African Americans and all that have been disenfranchised for so many years since I was a little girl. Um, for way over 50 years ago, you are the real deal. Never bought out and never bossed, just a sincere disciple of Jesus Christ. Your work has not gone unnoticed. So I think this is a, a note of appreciation <laughs> that um, that is being shared. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I've been married to the same Black woman for almost 50 years. And uh, she knew who I was. And she knew that our poverty would remain because of my commitments. Uh, on, I don't chase money. Uh, and the people I grew up around that I respect and admire, they were not capitalists. They were ministers. There's a difference between a minister and a preacher. The word minister means servant. Mm -hmm. You can't be a rich servant. That don't go together. <laughs> That's like, you know, <laughs> jumbo shrimp. Them words don't go together. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Here's a question kind of based on what you were just talking about with the NRA. Um, what about the NRA buying the vest for the police? What are your thoughts on that action? That, that suggestion that has made my day. That, 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 hey, that is a wonderful idea. Just the debate itself makes sense. You know, I, I, I just think that, um, that that is a wonderful idea. I, I think we ought to write them a letter and uh, make it a national letter, get our friends around the nation to sign it and suggest it to, suggest it to them. Mm -hmm. Y'all ought to create a fund uh, for police officers. And the, the, the people who produce and make money off of them dumb, dumb bullets and their mama piercing bullets, they ought to be made to pay, help pay for this that, that a police officer can survive with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I think you've stirred up something here. Um, what can we do to, uh, to start to heal um, the gun issues in the U.S.? So I think that's kind of some of the same, along the same lines of what you're discussing. What, what can we do to start to heal? 
I, I, I don't know because America, it, it, guns are so much a part of the American history and American story. But I think we that, that as a society, if we want our streets to be safe, we have to face up to this proliferation of guns. In Black America, because Black people tend to hate Black people, Black people tend to be more brutal and violent with each other than we are with anybody else. We have to have an open, honest discussion with our children about guns. Mm -hmm. I was doing a gun buyback at the Martin Luther King Center in South Dallas one day. And over the years, I've done gun buybacks. In fact, right now, I own over 3,000 guns that I've taken off the streets, primarily for my children, over, over a period of years, buying guns for my children. And uh, I've had a lot of experiences buying guns for my children. Uh, I bought four AK-7 machine guns one day in South Dallas from a gang. Mm. Girls. Mm. Did you hear me? You know what an AK-47 is? It's a goddamn machine gun. Now they claim they found them guns. <laughs> uh, and to, to give a friend of mine credit, I had a friend named Jimmy Bankston. I didn't have the money to buy it. Them girls wanted $1,200 a piece for them guns. I didn't have that kind of money. This was on a Saturday evening, like six, seven o'clock in the evening. And I called Jimmy Bankston and he got him at his automobile dealership. And I told him what I was doing and what, and I needed this money. And when I told him what it was for, you know what Jimmy said? How soon can you get here, Peter? Mm. So I bought those 24 guns with Jimmy Bankston's money. Wow. And we melted them down. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, just so that our audience knows, we have five minutes. Um, so if there is one more question or so, um, as we possibly wait for another question, I, I read in your bio um, that during your younger years, um, you were part of um, uh, organizing um, a group or a march through Bergalusa, Louisiana. Oh God! And you went through uh, the heart of Ku Klux Klan. Klan. <laughs> you went through the heart of Ku Klux Klan territory. Well, we marched from Bergalusa to the state capital in Baton Rouge. Somebody bled every day. Wow! Very, very bloody march. Yeah, all the way to the steps of the state capital. You're talk about the uh, "I Have Dreams" speech. That what happened there? Oh, Mahalia Jackson. <laughs> Mahalia, God, Mahalia had a real problem. She couldn't whisper. Her voice was so booming. So at the March on Washington, Mahalia standing on the stage behind everybody, Dr. King making his speech. And Mahalia, I guess she thinks she's whispering, but you can hear, hey, Martin, hey, Martin, you all tell them about your dream. And, and those of us who were under that, we were under the stage, most of the young people. I had been up in one of those trees uh, that day, but you could hear Mahalia's booming voice. And every now and then, I'd take a look back at her, and he would frown up, and she was distracting him. And finally, Martin just got frustrated, closed that book, and Brett Gander put him in lean back. And uh, Wide Walker said, we're going to church. And Dr. King told us about his dream. But Mahalia had heard Dr. King talk about that dream in Detroit, where she lived. Det uh, maybe a month or two before the March on Washington, Dr. King had spoke at a United Auto Workers March with Walter Luther. And uh, in Detroit, with 100,000 United Auto Workers and their families. And Martin made that speech that day and told about his dream. May I hear you what she sang that day? And she heard that speech. And the March on Washington, Dr. King 
and Wide Walk and CT Vivian and Andy Young and, and Ralph Abernathy, they stayed up all night working on Dr. King's speech mm. by the March on Washington. So when Dr. King closed that speech and didn't use it, and then all of them were, you know, it's because they stayed up all night working on that with, with Martin. And when he leaned back, and of course, it was church time then. So um, those are experiences I, I'll never forget. You know, that those days, and um, I was 18 years old. So that I'll let you know how seriously they took me. You know, what did Dr. King say to you the most to Peter? Peter said out and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said out and shut up. Absolutely. Wow. Well, Reverend Johnson, we are... I to tell a story about Motown. Okay, go ahead, please. So Barry Gordy and all our friends at Motown. Motown is Stax Records. Stax was in Memphis. And Motown was up in Detroit. We call it Detroit. Uh, but Motown was very close to the civil rights movement and to us. And the entertainers at Motown was very close to us. So it was Stax Records. Uh, Marvin Gaye, who was absolutely a genius in terms of music and talent. Marvin, daddy was a pastor of a church, and Marvin grew up in a black church. See, if you listen to Motown's music, Aretha Franklin grew up in her daddy's church. All of these great, great entertainers came out of black churches. Uh, I'm working with DOC now and with uh, Snoop Dogg and a number of other entertainers about moving to Dallas. You know why they're going to move to Dallas? Because they're going to build a Motown here. The talent is here. And if you don't think the talent is here, go to black churches. Not to mention the fact, UNT School of Jazz, every year you got kids graduating with four-year degrees in music. Motown is here just waiting for Snoop and DOC to build a Motown here. The, 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 the powerful black churches, and every black church you can go to, they got some voices in that church better than any voices you're going to hear on the radio. And of course, because that School of Jazz is here, musicians are here. So I'm I'm very excited about uh, my friend DOC and Snoop and them boys talking about moving down here and putting together a record company uh, in South Dallas and uh, taking advantage of this talent that's here. I am just amazed that you have the range of Marvin Gaye to Snoop Dogg. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> uh, what a leader you are. Um, and we uh, thank you for your leadership um, we thank you for your perseverance and not giving up. We thank you for listening um, to the voices of African-Americans over, over time um, and just really being a part of, of history um, and helping us. I mean, I think this tonight is very helpful for all of us to help all of us move the needle just a little bit further in our own lives. Would you agree, Andy? Um, just to move the needle for us all in our own lives. So just any parting words as we close. Charlie, yeah, I just want to say one thing about Kyle who said he and, and the Thanksgiving Square and his foundation. Yes, sir. Every time I come in this building, I think about Rosa Parks mm. because one day it was storming in Dallas and uh, Miss Parks was coming. I'd gone to the airport to pick up Rosa Parks. And I mean, it was storming and we brought her here to take pictures here. And I'll never forget that day. Ms. Parks thought, I like that Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. I just like that. And uh, Ms. Parks was a little 100 pound petite lady uh, that for us, she was the symbol of courage and strength. And every time I come in this building, I, I can't help but think about Rosa Parks and bringing her here that day. And that brainstorm. No. Absolutely. Well, you're gonna we're gonna have that same memory with you, even though we're all virtual, uh, of being here with you tonight um, in in that same uh, venue. So thank you uh, so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, um, Andy, um, and Thanksgiving Square for helping to uh, facilitate um, this conversation um, with uh, Reverend Peter Johnson. Uh, I'm gonna ask that uh, we open up our Zoom boxes so that Reverend Johnson can see. Um, all who have joined tonight.
um, to visit and listen to him. Um, so, uh, I, ladies see, and gentlemen, I see some names that I know, just some people from uh, my past that uh, I've had great relationships with. Absolutely. So if you want to turn your camera on, if you can share your camera so um, Reverend Johnson can, can see you. As I say on our uh, dime calls, we only care about what you look like up top. Um, what you what you have on below is, is up to you. So we just want to have everyone give Reverend Johnson a, a big wave, a big hug, virtual hug. Um, hey, well, what is that white stuff in your hair? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it is 7.03 and we want to abide by your time. Uh, thank you again, Reverend Johnson. Thank you again, Andy um, and Kyle um, with Thanksgiving Square for being a part of Project Unity. Um, and being able to bring this conversation to the Dallas community. Um, at this time, we will bid you all farewell. Um, have a great evening. God Stay bless safe. you all. Nice seeing you all of you all. Absolutely. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you.